Hi folks! This week we're going to make this simple little bookmark that will let us practice how to edit shapes and paths with an illustrator. This project will teach us how we can divide a shape or how we can trim it up using tools like the eraser, scissors, or knife tool. We'll also go over how we can use clipping masks and compound paths to create certain looks within our pieces. And we'll also get to talk about how we can join anchor points and how we can use the width tool to create tapered looks on paths. We'll also be able to do a quick review on how to use the blend tool, swatches, and gradients. So let's go ahead and just jump right into our project here. Now when you open up the file bookmark.ai, you should see something like this. I've already set up the basic structure for our lighthouse and little rocky face here. When you open up the document, you should notice there's a red line around the canvas. Remember, this is our bleed line. Later on, when we get further into the project, we are going to add a background that we want to be printed to the very edge of the canvas. When you have elements like that, you should add a bleed line. So that way those elements go a little bit further past the canvas. And when you go to print this out later on, if for some reason your trimmer isn't super exact, like let's say it cuts along here instead of right along the canvas here, that's going to be okay because we extended our background to reach that bleed line as a bit of a safe space in case our cutter isn't the most exact or if the paper alignment is a little bit off. So right now we've just got a very basic outline of our design for the bookmark right now, but eventually what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with something a little similar to this. So we're going to be able to make a majority of this just from the shapes that I already have set up here. Although we'll be making new custom shapes to add our windows, door, and add the little seagulls we have up at the top there. And then we'll also use a couple of rectangles to help us create our background in the end. So before we jump too far into the project, go ahead and go to Window, Workspace, and Essentials Classic. This should give you a layout similar to what I'm working with, so it'll make it a little bit easier to follow along. And there's also a couple tools in here that aren't available in some of the other workspaces. But don't worry if you are using a different workspace because you like it better. I will show you how you can add extra tools to your toolbar that maybe aren't originally defaulted to that particular workspace. Okay, now that I have the workspace sorted out, I'm going to go ahead and select my tower here. And what we're going to do is we are going to add some slices vertically about here and here to create a kind of octagonal look to the tower. And then we're also going to cut it horizontally so that way we can add uh, two red bands to the tower as well. Now if I go ahead and try kind of cutting it up and working with it now, it's going to be a little bit difficult because I've already got a bunch of these other design elements or these other paths here that might get in the way and I might accidentally select the wrong object. So to make my life a little bit easier is I am going to just double click on my outline here and you'll see the rest of the scene gets grayed out and then this bar appears along the top here. What this is showing me is that I am in isolation mode. Isolating an object makes it a little bit easier to work with because you can add whatever you want to it and it's not going to affect anything else in the scene. So if you have like a group with lots of fine details in it, you can just double click and go into isolation mode, edit the group however you want. And then to get out of isolation mode, you just go up to the top here and just click on this arrow until that gray bar disappears. And that allows you to edit a group without having to use right click, ungroup, and then regroup it all again. You can just work directly within it or in our case here, what isolation mode will allow us to do is it'll let us cut up this shape here without having to worry about affecting anything else in the scene. So the first tool I want to grab is I'm going to look for my knife tool. Now the knife tool is typically if you right click on the eraser, you should see the knife tool in there as long as your workspace is set to Essentials Classic. If you don't see it in here, then you're probably working in a different workspace. A way that you can add the knife tools one, change your workspace, or if you go down to these ellipses down at the bottom here and click on that, you should see a list of all of the different tools available within Illustrator. Now, because of the workspace I have picked out, all these are grayed out, but if I wanted to Tell you what, let me switch my workspace here. So I've got Essentials turned on rather than Essentials Classic. 
So when I go to the eraser, you see the knife tool is not in there. So if I go to these three ellipses here, I just find the knife tool within this list. Uh, there is, it should be under modify and it should be like the last tool in that section. I can just click and drag this into my toolbar. And if I want to add it to my eraser, I just hover over it until that blue box appears. And when I let go, knife tool is now added into that nest of tools there. I'm going to go ahead and switch back to Essentials Classic. And now what I want to do is I'm going to first create the long cuts here. Now when you just kind of try and hand do it, you can kind of see that I get a little bit of a squiggly line. Illustrator does try to help, but if you want to make a perfectly straight line, just hold Alt or Option on your keyboard and then click and drag down the shape here and you can see it's making a perfectly straight line for me. Now I'm going to undo that because I want a bit of a, more of a diagonal added here. And keep in mind when you are cutting up a shape, don't try and get like right on the line because it's harder than you think to try and get that cut all the way through by starting on the path. It's easier just to start outside of the object hold alt, click, and then drag down. So that way you absolutely know that you're cutting completely through the object. And you can see that my ending point is completely out the other side as well. So I'm going to make a cut like that. I'm just going to let go of my mouse. Then I'm going to go over here, hold alt, click, and drag down. And it's okay if it's not perfectly symmetrical. Sometimes that uneven look adds to your design. So now if I switch over to my black arrow or my selection tool and I grab each of these pieces, you can see they've been separated into their own shapes now because of the knife tool. Next what I want to do is I want to create some banding so that way I can add those red stripes to the tower. So I'm going to go back to my knife tool, except this time I want to make sure my line is perfectly horizontal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold Alt or Option, and then I'm going to hold Shift as well. And I'm just going to cut through, and you can see no matter how I wiggle my knife, it's always going to be a perfectly horizontal line. It also works with vertical lines as well, so if I do Alt or Option plus Shift, I can go completely vertical as well. Now I'm going to undo that last line I made. And then I'm going to cut horizontally. Again, I'm holding Alt or Option plus Shift. I'm going to add another band down here. There we go. So now I should have one, two, three, four, five sections on my tower. So these two are going to be red bands and then the rest are going to be a gray cream color. Now what I want to do is I want to kind of back out of this isolation mode. So I'm just going to go up to the top here and just click on this arrow, keep clicking on it until the gray bar disappears. Now another note for when you're working on or working with the knife tool, if you're not in isolation mode and you go to use the tool, be careful because even though you might want to just cut through this section here or this shape here, if I just kind of start cutting, you'll see it cuts through every shape I have passed over. So if I only want the knife to affect the object I want to work on, I can just click on the object, switch over to my knife, and then no matter how I cut it, it's only ever going to affect the object I have selected. So that's another way to isolate your object when you're working with a knife tool. All right, next up, what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and make my railing up here. So I'm just going to zoom in. Remember, if you want to zoom in or out, it's going to be control or command. Technically, it's the equal sign, but if you're looking at the key, it's the plus sign with the equal sign underneath it. So it's going to be Control or Command Plus, and then Control or Command Minus to zoom out. And if you want to move your scene around, you can hold down the space bar, and that will give you the hand tool. And that will let you move your canvas around into the right position so you can see what you're doing. 
So I've already got the two ends of my railing set up. I want to add some bars across this middle section here. Now I can just select one, hold Alt, hold Shift, and then just kind of keep making duplicates over and over. But it's a little bit hard to get even spacing that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my Blend Tool. And I'm going to click on my first bar, click on my second bar. And you'll see that it completely fills the area with black. Remember, usually it kind of goes a little bit overkill when you're using the Blend Tool. So in order to kind of change the settings within here, is I'm just going to double click on the tool itself. Switch that from smooth color to specified steps. And I'm just going to bring this way down. So depending on how many railings or how many bars you want in your railing, you can pick a either higher or lower number. I think with this particular design, I think I'm going to go with, I think 10 looks good. So I'm just going to hit OK. And there we go. Another way to do this is I can just select both objects, go to Object, Blend, and Make, and then I just go to Object, Blend, Blend Options, and again I just go to Specified Steps, let's try out 10, and then just hit OK. Alright, I'm going to zoom out, and I think what I'm going to make next is I'm going to make the door and the windows for my shape here, or for my tower. So in order to make the door, I'm going to start off with a circle. So I'm just going to find my rectangle tool, right click, and go to the ellipse tool. You can also cycle through a set of nested tools by holding the Alt or option key and then just keep clicking on the tool and it'll cycle through all of them. You can also just click and hold to bring up this nest of options here. So go ahead and grab your ellipse tool and make a perfect circle. You can make a perfect circle by holding alt or option on your keyboard and shift. So I've got my circle here and then I'm going to switch over to my rectangle tool and I'm just going to deselect that, grab my rectangle, and then I'm going to start at this point here. I am level with the center of the circle, and I'm over that anchor point there, and I'm just going to click and drag across until I hit the other side of the circle, and then I'm going to go down. And depending on how tall you want your door to be or your windows, because we're going to use the same basic shape for both of them, just make a tall rectangle here. There we go. And then I'm just going to grab my selection tool. I'm going to select both objects. And I'm going to go over to my Pathfinder panel. If you don't already have it off to your right, you can just go to Window and Pathfinder, and it'll pop it right open. And what we're going to do is we're going to select this first option here so that way it unites into one arc here. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. Okay, and then I'm going to use the same basic shape for both the door and the windows here. So I'm just going to hold Alt on my keyboard or Option if you're using a Mac. And then I'm just going to click and drag so that way I have a duplicate. So let's go ahead and start off with making our door. What I want to do is I'm going to add a window to it and I'm just going to do that by grabbing my ellipse tool. And then I'm going to try and find the center here and I'm just going to make a circle. And I'm going to make my window a little bit smaller. There we go. And I'm just going to bring it down. And then I'm just going to duplicate this shape. So I'm going to hit Control or Command C. And then Control or Command Shift V. And what that should have done is it should have made a duplicate circle in the exact same spot. And then I'm just going to resize this one so that way it is a touch smaller. And I'm going to make a couple more circles that are going to act as like the shine on my window. So 
I'm just gonna move this one over here. And I'm gonna make a slightly smaller one down here. There we go. Make that a skosh bigger. And then remember you can nudge shapes around with your arrow keys. I think that looks good. So and then finally I'm just going to add a doorknob. You can make your doorknob as elaborate as you want. I'm just going to do a kind of simple circle doorknob. Okay, next up is I want to add some wood planks to my door here. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm actually going to use my scissors tool for that. So I'm just going to select my scissors. Then I'm going to go over here and I kind of want an uneven kind of plank look. So I'm just going to click once up here, click once down here. And you notice that it's adding anchor points to the path here. But it's not just adding anchor points. It's also separating our path at those points. So like if I just stop here and I grab this section here, you can see where I clicked with my scissors, it's now separated that path up. And the reason I'm doing this is I want each plank to be its own color and it's going to be easier to just kind of cut it up this way. So I'm going to switch back to my scissors and I'm just going to kind of keep cutting up my door. See, it's giving me this error because I had this corner selected and not the rest of the door here. So I'm just going to hit OK. And then I'm going to deselect everything and then go back to my scissors. And then I'm going to keep adding anchor points kind of along the path here. I'm going to go over here. And I'm just going to keep adding planks of wood. Okay. So I've got my door all cut up now, but you can kind of see one of my problems here is they aren't complete shapes. They are just paths that aren't enclosed. And I actually want to fix that because I want the each plank to be an enclosed shape. So I'm just going to select one segment here. I'm going to switch over to my direct selection tool. I'm going to select this top anchor point. I'm going to hold shift and select the bottom anchor point. And then I'm going to right click and hit join. And now it's created a brand new shape for me or an enclosed shape. So now for this next section, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this section here and this section here. Now you can see instead of having a continuous line that I need to connect, I've got actually two separate paths that I want to join. So this time I'm going to use the shortcut. So I'm going to use control or command J and you can see it joins one side. And if I hit control or command J again, it will connect the other side as well. So I'll do that one more time. So I'm going to select this segment, select that segment. And then if I do right click join, it's connected the right side. And if I do right click join again, it's connected the left side. So I'm going to select up here and I'm actually going to cut this one up one more time. There we go. So now I'm going to grab that segment, this segment, control or command J, control or command J. And I'm just going to keep doing that down the entire length of my door. And if you need to, you can always just kind of move a section off to the side and make sure it's joined everything. It's like on that one, I didn't quite join the other side. So I'm just going to hit Control J again. Make sure I got this one. Oop. There we go. So now I'm going to grab these. And then I'm just going to use my white arrow to kind of move these two anchor points over this way. There we go. I think I'm happy with that. And then I'm just going to double check this one isn't closed. Nope. So I'm just going to select it and hit Control or Command J. And now these all 
Should be their own separate pass. Looks like I forgot that one too. There we go. So now if I kind of separate all my planks out, you can see that they're their own shapes. Okay, I'm gonna go and do this and bring my door back. And I'm gonna go ahead and select all these planks and I'm gonna do control G to group them. You can also right click and go to groups. That way they're all together. And then I'm just gonna right click arrange, send to back, so that way it's behind my window. And then I'm going to select everything, so I'm going to select the wood, plus the window, and the doorknob, and then I'm going to group that as well. So now I have a group within a, another group here. So there's my door. We'll worry about coloring it in later. Now I'm going to go ahead and move on to my window here. Now to kind of make it easier to see what's going on, I'm going to select this shape here and then I'm going to add a fill to it. It doesn't really matter what color you pick right now. We'll change it later. But I'm just going to do a light blue here. Or tell you what, I'll grab that blue. And then I'm going to do the control or command C and then control or command shift V. And I've made a duplicate here and then to make it easier to see what's going on, I'm going to change the fill of this top one. There you go. And then I'm going to do the control or command C and then control or command shift V one more time. So I have three copies. And then for this top copy, what I'm going to do is with it still selected, I'm just going to hold down alt and shift on my keyboard and I'm going to scale it down. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this middle part here. I'm going to select this outer part here. And then if I go to right click, and make compound path, what it should do is it should cut out the middle of my shape. Now you might be wondering what is the difference between making a compound path and just going over to our pathfinder and using the exclude option. Well when we use the pathfinder is it creates a brand new shape with that middle part cut out. By making this a compound path, if I decide that I don't want to have it cut out anymore, I can just right click release compound path and they're now two separate shapes again. This is handy for like if you need to quickly kind of edit a shape a bit. You can either release the compound path or if it's still a compound path you can kind of go in and edit individual anchor points or individual shapes within that compound path. Next up what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some sectioning in my window here, so I'm going to switch over to my rectangle tool and I'm just going to make a tall skinny rectangle and to help me make sure that everything is centered, I'm just going to select all of my objects. Remember an easy way to do that is just click and drag out to select everything and then I'm just going to go over to a line. If you don't already have a line off to your right, just go to window and a line and the panel will pop up. And I'm just going to use the second option here to make sure everything's lined up. And then I am just going to rotate this rectangle. So I want my horizontal bars to be the same width as my vertical. So I'm just going to right click, transform, rotate, and I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. And then I'm going to hit copy, not OK. I'm going to hit copy. And then I'm just going to resize this so that way it stays within my window here. And I'm not worried about trying to line up the paths. I actually want to make sure that the rectangles overlap with the inside part of my windowsill here. And I'm going to select my crossbar here and the outer part of my window. Make sure I don't have this light blue area. And then I'm going to go to Pathfinder. Again, you can use Window Pathfinder to bring up the panel. And then I'm just going to use Unite, or the very first option, to make it all one big shape. And then I'm just going to switch over to my white arrow, and I'm just going to tweak the placement of my vertical bar here by selecting these anchor points, and I'm just going to use my arrow key to nudge it down. There we 
There we go. And then I'm going to go ahead and select everything and I'm going to group it. And I'm not worried too much about the colors right now. I will change those up in a sec. For right now, I'm just going to group everything and make sure everything's shaped the way I want to. So next is I'm just going to zoom out here and I'm going to start adding in the base colors for my lighthouse here. So I'm going to start off down here and I'm going to select the middle section here. And I'm going to set the stroke to none. And I'm doing this within the properties panel. You can also change these settings by going up to the top here. The second drop down controls your stroke. This one controls your fill. Or you can go to your color panel. You can find that by going to window color. And this solid square is your fill. The one with the hole is your stroke. So I'm going to set the stroke to none and for the fill I'm going to switch this over to the color and I'm going to pick a kind of a gray creamy color. I think I'm just going to use my color panel here and double click that so that way I have my traditional color picker and I'm just going to I'm kind of in the oranges And I think I'm going to pick that. Well, I might go a little bit darker. Because I do want one side to be highlighted. So I think I'll use that color. Then I'm going to hit OK. Then I'm going to select the left side here. And I want this to be a darker color of my middle section here. So I'm going to hit I on my keyboard to bring up the eye chopper tool. I'm going to select that middle part. And then I'm just going to use my color panel. And I'm just going to make this a slightly darker color. Don't think I want that extreme. I think that looks good. And then I'll hit OK. Then I'm going to switch back to my selection tool, select the right side, switch back to my eyedropper, grab the middle. And this time I'm going to pick a lighter color. Then I'm going to hit OK. Now in order to make my life a little bit easier, I'm going to go to my swatches panel. If you don't immediately see it off to your right, just go to window and swatches. And I'm just going to click my fill color here and drag it down into the swatches panel. And I'm going to do that for all three colors here. So that way it will be easy to apply them to the rest of the piece. There we go. Then I'm going to go up to the next band here. I'm going to select the middle section. This time I'm going to pick a red I want to use. So I'm going to change the stroke to none, change the fill. I'm going to use my color panel actually. I'm going to pick kind of a maybe a more muted red. Is it okay? So that's going to be my mid-tone, so I'm going to select the left side, use my eyedropper by hitting the eye on my keyboard. I'm going to select that color, and I'm just going to make that a little bit darker by using the case slider. Then I'm going to switch back to my selection tool, use my eyedropper. This time I'm going to make it a slightly lighter pink. Maybe not that. There we go. Hit OK. And I'm going to go back to the swatches panel and I'm going to add all three of these to my swatches as well. There we go. And now I want this one and this one. And I selected both of them by selecting one, holding shift, and then selecting the other one. Then I can just use my swatches to grab my dark color. I can do that on the same here to grab my light color. Then grab my middle tones. Set those up. Alternatively, I can also just select a shape and use the eyedropper to duplicate the properties.
And then I'm just going to select these sections and turn off the stroke. There we go. And now I'm going to go up to the top here. And rather than kind of cutting this one up to make that octagonal look, I am going to just add gradients to kind of this section here and then these sections here. So I'm going to grab this rectangle right here. I'm going to go to my gradient panel. If you don't see it off to your right, by default, just go to Window and Gradient. And I'm just going to click down in the gradient slider to apply a gradient, but then I'm just going to double click on that first slider and I'm going to switch this over to my swatches. I want to grab my dark cream color. I want to click in the middle. You can see a plus sign appears next to my cursor. Then I'm going to make this my middle tone for the cream. And then for this last one, I'm going to set that to my lightest color. Now, depending on how much contrast you have between the three sets, you may see a big difference. You may not. That's fine. Just make sure this is your dark color, this is your middle color, and this is your light color. And if you're looking up here, the dark color should be to the left, middle in the middle, and then your lighter tone to the right. And I want to make sure that this particular slider is right in the middle. I got close at 48% if I'm looking at location here, but I'm just going to click in location. I'm just going to type in 50 so that way I know that middle tone is right in the middle. And there we go. And then I am going to turn off the stroke on that section as well. And I'm going to select this one. And I'm going to select this one as well. And I'm going to turn off stroke on both of them. I'm going to apply a gradient. Except this time I want the end one here to use my dark red. This needs to be my middle tone. And again, I'm just double clicking on the sliders to bring this menu up. And then my light red. If you want, you can also fudge with your colors a little bit. So like if you want to lighten up one of them, I can just grab my sliders here and just kind of add a little extra highlight. There we go. And then you can change the angle by using this menu here, or if you go to your left, you'll see there's another gradient tool. This lets you kind of manually mess with the sliders on the scene. You can also click and drag to create a custom look to it. I am just going to stick with a horizontal radial like this, or a horizontal gradient like this. Next up is I'm going to switch back over to my selection tool. I'm going to grab this middle part here and then I'm going to turn off the stroke one more time. And then I'm going to pick a fill for my glass. So I think what I'm going to make this one is I'm going to make it like a dark blue green or maybe just like a dark blue. Maybe add a bit more green to it. There we go. Okay. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and move my door and my window into place here. So I'm going to grab my door. Because I grouped it, doesn't matter where I click on the object, it will always grab the entire thing. So I'm just going to move it over here. Then I'm going to resize it so that way it fits in or within the bottom stripe there. I'm going to place it in the middle of my tower. There we go. And then I want to start adding some color to my door here. So I'm going to double click on it to enter the group. I'm going to double click on it one more time so that way I'm within the group we made that has all of our planks. And I'm just going to grab the first plank and I'm going to use my eyedropper tool to kind of alternate between these three colors up here. So tell you what, I'm going to select this one and grab the dark red. I'll grab that one. Grab the middle tone. I'm just going to keep kind of cycling through each one. And 
Again, if it's selecting the entire thing rather than individual planks, make sure you have your black arrow, arrow or your selection tool and just double click on it one more time. Up in the top here, you should see we're in layer one. We're within one group and then we're in within a second isolated group. It looks like I duplicated the color here. There we go. Okay, so I have each individual plank colored, and then I can just go one more up to this group here. And I'm going to pick some colors for my window. So I think for this one, I'm actually going to match the color that I had up here. So I'm just going to use my eyedropper tool to grab that and scroll back down. There we go. Then I'm going to select this middle circle here. I'm going to duplicate the color again, but this time I'm going to use a slightly lighter blue. There we go. And then for these highlights here, I'm just going to turn off the stroke and set the fill to white. There we go. And then I'm just going to make myself a little gold doorknob. Or, tell you what, I'm going to make my doorknob brass. there okay and then I'm just going to keep clicking on this arrow until that way the gray bar at the top disappears I'm going to just double check that this is aligned with the bottom here there we go I'm going to zoom back out I'm going to look for my window and then let's just grab it and move it over here And I'm going to place it within this band here. And then to go within the group, I'm just going to double click on it. I'm going to select kind of the windowsill part here. And I am going to duplicate the dark red for it. Then I'm going to grab the actual glass part and I'm going to duplicate. I think I'll duplicate the dark blue. Then I can just back out of this isolation mode. I think I'm going to go in and just make this a little darker of a red. There we go. And then I think I'm actually going to switch over to my white arrow. And you don't have to do this part. I'm just doing this for my own sake. I'm just going to select these anchor points here and I'm just going to nudge them up a touch. So that way it's going to kind of change how my tower is sectioned out. If you liked how yours was sectioned out, you don't have to change it. I just did this for my own kind of preferences and then I'm going to, with the selection tool, I'm going to hold Alt or Option on my keyboard, and then I'm just going to drag straight up. If I hold Shift, it'll make sure everything stays aligned. And then I'm just going to switch back to my white arrow and kind of lengthen up this red band here. There we go. Maybe you're going to nudge this down. And you know what? To add a little bit of extra life to my door, I'm going to go down here. I'm going to double click on it again to go back into that group. And I'm going to use the ellipse tool to just kind of add a little highlight to my doorknob. It was looking a little dull. And 
If you're having trouble moving around a smaller object, just kind of zoom in. And it'll make it a little bit easier. There we go. There we go. Tell you what, rather than making them pure white, I'm going to just make them a paler version of the doorknob. There we go. I think that'll look nice. Okay, and then next I'm going to use a mask to help me add some highlights to the top of my lighthouse here. So I'm just going to make a rectangle. Okay, and then I'm going to go up to transform. Say 30. I think 30 looks good. Then I'm just going to widen this band here. I'm going to use my selection tool, hold alt or option, hold shift as well, and then I'm just going to make another band here and then I'm going to use my direct selection tool to select these individual anchor points and I'm just using my arrow keys to nudge it over so that way I have a nice big thick sheen and a skinny sheen. There we go. And I'm going to set both these to white. And I'm going to move them over to my window here. And I think I'm going to select these top anchor points here and just kind of nudge them over so the shear isn't quite as strong. There we go. Okay, so now what I can do, I can just grab these anchor points and drag them down so they fit within the glass here. That's a little bit more effort than I want to put into this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make another rectangle. And I'm going to make it the exact same size as my glass. Alternatively, what we can do is we can just select the glass, do control C, and then control or command shift V. And then I select the top piece of glass. I select the next shine. And then I select this shine. In order to select multiple objects, just click on one, hold shift, and keep clicking until you select all your objects. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and do make clipping mask. And what it's going to do is it's going to use this big rectangle here as a guide for where it needs to trim the rest of the shine here. So I'm just going to hit make clipping mask. And you can see now that it's keeping it within the glass here. But if I hover over it, you can see that my shapes are still in there. And if I use my white arrow, I can actually select these individually and move them around. So again to do all that I make my two sheens and then either make a brand new rectangle that's the same size as the blue glass here or just do control slash command C control or command shift V and then select the top glass one sheen two sheen right click make clipping mask. Alright, you can see that our lighthouse is slowly kind of coming together. Next up what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this section here. I don't want these two lines actually, so I'm just going to select these two rocks and this third one here. And I'm going to turn off the stroke. And for the fill, I'm going to 
pick a nice rich dark brown. I'm just going to hit OK. You can kind of see that my two pieces here kind of disappeared. In order to kind of bring them back, I'm just going to select both of them. And I'm going to add a stroke onto these ones. And if I go up to my color panel here, I can click on the fill color and drag it over to the stroke. And I'll duplicate the two colors and then I can just grab my stroke. And just darken it. So again, to do that, if you want to use the same color on your stroke as your fill or you want to use that fill color as a base for your stroke, just in the color panel, select the fill, click on it, and drag it over to the stroke and it will apply that color to the stroke as well. You can edit it however you need to. So I'm going to really darken mine up. Then I'm going to select these two here. I'm going to use my eyedropper tool to duplicate the property over on this rock here. And I should have something that looks like this. Next up, I'm going to go ahead and make my background. So I'm going to go over to my layers panel. If you don't immediately see it off to your right, just go to window and layers. And I'm going to make a brand new layer. I'm going to drag layer two down so that way it's underneath layer one. I'm going to lock layer one so that way I don't accidentally edit it. And then I'm just going to use my rectangle tool to make one big rectangle that covers the entire background. Make sure that your rectangle reaches your bleed lines because re remember if you have something that needs to be printed to the edge, you need to extend it past that canvas. So that way if our trimmer's off, we still won't have any blank spaces or white paper around the design. And I'm just going to turn off the stroke on it. And I'm just going to pick a random color. Just so that way I can see what's going on. And I'm going to make another rectangle here. This one's not going to go as high, but it still needs to reach my bleed lines. So I'm going to go like halfway up the first white band here at the bottom. And I'm going to make another rectangle. I'm going to change the color of this one so I can easily see it later. Okay, next up is, now that I have my two rectangles here, this is going to be my ocean and this is going to be my sky. So I'm just going to shorten this rectangle up. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my gradient panel. I'm going to make sure the fill is selected. And I'm just going to click in the gradient slider here and I'm going to pick my colors that I want for my sky. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it go from a let's say a light blue a very pale light blue and then I'll get rid of this middle one for right now and then I'll click on the end one and I'll make that still a fairly light blue but it's going to be a bit more vibrant than my one on the left here And then I think I'll add one more slider and I'll make that kind of a deeper, darker blue. There we go. And then I'm just going to kind of space these out. Alright, that's a color combination I want, but I don't like the angle it's going at. Now I can use this menu here to change the angle, or if I want, I can go over to the left side here grab my gradient tool and then just click and drag to make my sky. Now the idea is your very pale light blue should start kind of down at the bottom here and then you can always kind of edit your gradient there we go that's the look I want. Then I'm going to go down here. I'm going to add another gradient again. But I want to use some different blues. And I think I'm going to throw in a purple as well for my water. So I'm just going to kind of mess with these. I'm going to 
add in a purple. Then I'm going to use my gradient tool. There you go. Let me try this one more time there. I've got my gradient tool. I'm just going to kind of mess with this until I get the look I want out of my water. If you want, if your colors are going in the wrong direction, you can always hit this icon here and it will flip your gradient around. So I can kind of... There we go. I think that's the look I want with the gradient. All right, next up is I don't quite want my water to be quite so flat. I do want to add a bit of a wobble to the top here. So an easy way to do that is I'm just going to find my eraser tool. And then what I'm going to do is the idea is I want to kind of go along the top here to give it an, ir an irregular edge here. And I want a fairly big brush for it. Now the size I have it at right now will work great, but if yours is a s smaller size or a way bigger size, the way you change the size of your eraser is just double click on the tool. And this is going to give you all the options for that tool. So I'm going to leave mine at 20 points. And then the reason mine says pressure is I have a pressure sensitive device hooked up to it. And basically that means is when I'm using my pen is it will use pen pressure on my eraser. Or if I use the blob brush, it will use the pen pressure to kind of taper things off. Whether you have pressure enabled or not, it doesn't really matter for this project. Fixed is going to be fine as well. But I'm just going to leave my settings the way they are. I'm going to hit OK. And then the idea is I want to just kind of trim off a bit of the top of the rectangle here. I want to try and get it as level as possible. That's okay if there's a slight wobble to it because I do want to create that kind of effect of waves. So it's a bit too wobbly, so I'm going to try it one more time. I dip down a little too far. There we go. And the reason I'm not holding shift is because I do want that irregular wobble. I just don't want it to be super pronounced. And then I can always go in with my delete anchor point tool and kind of delete circuit certain anchor points or I can use my direct selection tool to kind of edit some of these if I need to. Okay, I think I'm happy with that. I might bring down this side here. There we go. Oh yeah, I'm starting to be really happy with our bookmark here, but the background is a little bit blank. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some little stylized birds in the background. So an easy way to get what I want is I'm actually going to use the ellipse tool as a base. But what I am trying to achieve is I'm trying to achieve these kind of stylized M birds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my ellipse tool and I'm just going to make a perfect circle by holding alt and shift. I'm going to set the fill to none on these and then I'm going to give it a black stroke. Then I'm going to switch over to my black arrow. I'm going to hold alt, shift, and then drag a duplicate circle over. Now I want this new circle to be touching the edge of my old one. You can see I've got those magenta lines telling me that the centers are aligned and the edges are touching. And then I'm going to switch over to my direct selection tool. I'm just going to select these bottom two anchor points. And then I'm just going to hit delete on my keyboard. So now I'm left with this M here, but you can see 
that they're just kind of two arcs touching. In order to make them one continuous path, I'm going to select this middle part here. And then I can either do right click join or I can do that control slash command J. And now this is one continuous path. I think I'm also going to grab that middle part and just kind of pull it down a little bit. So that way the M is more pronounced. And then I'm going to select the path. I'm going to click on the word stroke. And then I'm going to change the cap to that rounded cap. I think it just looks a little bit nicer. And then this M shape looks kind of really boring. It's just one width, one tone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my widths tool. The shortcut for that should be Shift W. If you don't immediately see it off to your left, look for one of these other tools here. But what this width tool allows us to do is it allows us to take something like a path and add weight to it at certain parts along that path. So I'm going to go up near the top. I want to go where it says anchor and I'm going to click and drag outward. And you can see it's making my line thicker. I'm going to do that for this side as well. Click and drag out. And then I want these two ends to have nice sharp corners. So I'm going to click and drag in. So that way they have nice sharp corners. Click and drag in. There we go. And if I wanted to, I could add some more points to change the width on and get some really weird looks. But I'm just going to leave it at this right here. If you want, you can always go back and hover over where you add your width segment. And you can either move it along the path if you click in the middle or if you grab these outer edges, you can make it just a little bit thicker. There we go. Then I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to change the color of my stroke to white to kind of make them look like seagulls. Then I'm just going to move it over here. I'm going to resize it. And you see I have this issue where, where I res when I resize it, it's not scaling the width down. So it is changing from this nice, long, elegant path to kind of this short, stubby bird here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my Properties panel. If you don't already have it open, just go to Window and Properties. And I'm going to click on these three ellipses here. And where it says Scale, Strokes, and Effects, I'm going to check mark that. So now if I rescale this, it should scale down the stroke as well. And I've still got that basic look that I wanted in the first place. So I'm going to add the first bird about here. Then I'm going to hold alt to create some duplicates. I'm just going to add a smattering of birds over here as well. I'm going to change the rotation. I think I might actually reflect these. There we go. I think that looks nice. If you want, you can add more birds. You can also add like maybe a sailboat in the background. You can add some clouds to your bookmark. I think I'm just going to leave my bookmark as is. Make sure you save your Illustrator file. And if you want to use this, and like post it somewhere on your social media and kind of share the project you did with Teach Me That. You can always go to File, Export, Export As. And you can see that it'll give you a choice to save type. You can pick like either JPEG, PNG, SVG if you want, whatever version, whatever file type you want to use. But just make sure no matter what format you're using, Make sure you check mark use artboards. That way it won't include the bleed on our digital file. 
and then just hit export when you're ready to export and it will give you a JPEG or a PNG that you can use. So like when you hit export, it will usually bring up another dialog window. Uh, just make sure that the color mode is set to whatever project you are wanting to work on. For our bookmark, since the idea is we'd want these to be printed, I would just leave the color model as CMYK. You always want your resolution to make sure it is set at 300 ppi. If you're making something that is never going to leave a computer screen, usually setting the resolution to 72 or would work just as well. I usually like to set all my prints to 300, so that way it looks good no matter what. But if I'm doing like a small icon for a site, I would just drop this down to screen. But since most of my stuff is meant to be printed out, I'm just going to leave that as high, then hit OK. And then if I look in that folder, I have a nice PNG of my bookmark here that I can use. Well, that's our project for today. Remember, uh, this document is just set at 2 inches by 5 inches. So if you want to print this out and use it in your own books, you can just print it out on a regular 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. Uh, you can also print it out on cardstock if you want something a little bit stiffer. That's all we're going to do for this lesson. If you want to learn a little bit more about working with Illustrator, there are a few other videos on this channel that go over how to use Illustrator. There's also a couple other projects on this channel you might find interesting. So go ahead and check those out if you want to learn more. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.